So transfer trade and utility corridors. So it's not just pipelines. It's not just that, but you know, maybe if that's the anchor, or maybe it's rail, maybe rail's the anchor first. But it's literally talking about finding these corridors, putting them in the sweet spots across the province and tying into the rest of the country so we can <clears throat> start working together as a nation again. So BC, well, yeah, that's been a bit of a problem out there. Has anyone heard about BC being a challenge? <laughs> so, you know, part of this is, yeah, we, we need to get the access to the coast. And, uh, you know, depending on the flavor of the week, some people are figuring if you become an independent nation, that'll make it easier. Uh, I, I don't know about that. I don't think the UN would throw in blue helmets here and make sure that we could have soldiers' protections built in BC. So, obviously, that's diplomatic that we have to get through. Um, Bill C 48, that was a big killer for us. Obviously, with the tanker ban off the coast, one specific product that had anything to do with fishermen. Uh, smooth sailing until we hit Quebec. Well, they like everything except oil. Everything else we're on board with. Uh, Churchill, well, it's a great place. Six weeks of the year. The rest of it, you need icebreakers. And we were talking about the, the rail that goes up there currently. There's a reason why it was sold for a buck. Again, we talked about that a little bit earlier with some folks. It's not the track itself. It's the actual right-of-way that's important. And the terminals down there have been run down for a number of years. So if you're going to go back to the Hudson's Bay, you've got to figure out who your market is. Is it east? Is it Europe? Or are we just going to try to sell it to Nova Scotia. Um, one of the advantages is when you start to look logistically at this is, okay, if I was going to Churchill, where would I be thinking of bringing product from? So if I'm going out of the Greater Edmonton area, which just happens to be us, by the way, if I'm going out of the Greater Edmonton area and I got access to Alaska, and if I got Alaskan product coming that way for backhauls, so then can I shorten the shipping lines and stop the traffic in the Panama Canal? and then potentially move it that way, and then we can claim some of our northern sovereignty. When you start putting the pieces together, maybe that starts to make sense. So we got uh, main railroads, uh, and you think about this, Trans-Canada, everything built up along the railroad. So Johnny McDonald and company, they, they were nation builders. Here's our chance to be nation builders again. And where I'm starting to, to look at is, obviously it's, it's starting to look northwest is where some of that would take place. We have lots of talk, so it's not a foreign concept. You basically drop utilities in these ring roads. We've been doing that for years. But as uh, pipeline and everything else, we're kind of making some of the facto corridors, whether regulators have been steering us there or not. But the issue is, is they treat everyone like a sin singular snowflake. So all these projects have to go through the entire process, and for whatever reason, it's it's been kind of that Russian roulette thing where you're trying to do a little bit better than the next guy, so your approval will be quicker. And that's where we start getting these problems. Expectations get way too high, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, regulators, oh my gosh, red tape intensive. Used to be three years for get us to get a pipeline project built. It's ten years just to get through the regulatory, and then there's no guarantees. So that's sending a terrible message for investment. Terrible message. Uh, we sold ourselves short on how much we could grow for the finished products. We've been great at exporting raw commodities and being subject to whatever the exchanges are. So where we got to get to again is that value add chain, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's leading technologies, whether it's aerospace, whether it's the ag side, folks that actually want finished food products. And one of the things that we uh, had seen there, obviously, with COVID, was one week, if we didn't keep those truck lines open to the states, one week we start. We literally cannot get the products that we need anymore. The just-in-time delivery model, the offshoring, any of the, the value add that we had, in, you know, wearing some of these masks here, by offshoring all of that stuff, it was all eroded within the first month and a half of COVID. The savings that we had, it was 6.5 times percent in the market by the time we needed all these masks. So we've eroded that. So onshoring is going to be another thing that we're looking at. Pre-approved logistics area are an issue. Again, it's that project certainty you missed. I can go build any project you want. Give me a wind, wind generation farm, give me solar, I don't care, it'll be good. Uh, hurt SIGs, uh, hot SIGs, steam generation, give me a new, I can put a nuclear facility if I'm not concerned about that. What concerns me is regulatory. Time and time and time again. That's what comes up. We could drop in more refineries, we can do more cut can, we can do all of that. It's the regulatory process. And unfortunately, we poison the well so bad that unless there's some backing by a government in one way, shape, or form saying, yeah, we, we, we want to baptize this one, we think it's a good one. Industry is really nervous, investment community down south of the border and globally is, is nervous about it. So if we can actually get to a point where we've got these corridors, essentially if we build it, but then these corridors are pre-approved. Uh, so what changes? Well, we have a new government. That kind of helps. We still have, uh, the departments and every, you know, just think of it, your corporation, you had a hostile takeover. And uh, you know, as one of the gentlemen pointed out, he was in that environment for a number of years. You had a new group coming in. The pendulum doesn't switch or change that quick. It gets canceling from one side to the next. So it's a bit of a, a march in progress. But there are new marching orders. There is a new mandate. And that's really what the significance there. 
Uh, believe it or not, at the provincial level, we're solid as a country. Despite what the news tells you, the premiers, unprecedented time in history, are working very strongly together. We actually have the Quebec Premier lobbying the Prime Minister saying, what are you guys doing for Alberta and the oil sector? We got some of the have not product or provinces were saying they're running our economic crisis out here, saying, hey, we know we've been getting transfer payments from you guys for a number of years. Alberta, if you need it, we'll slide it back to you. Like, this is the support that we have nationally, but you don't hear about that. But those are the things that are taking place. And, you know, despite our jabs back and forth to Quebec, it's frustrations and irritant and all that stuff, absolutely. But they're 100% with us, with the exception of the oil side. So we got to get that one worked out. But if we get gas, electricity, everything else going that way and commerce flowing, well, okay, let's accept 90% of the battle rather than dying to the death of the last 9%. Um, so the Premier's agreement by Scott Moe, that was, that was paramount, talking about this trade corridors and, and fair trade amongst provinces. Fair deal panel report, obviously that came up. Tons and tons of consultation went into that. And it wasn't just the town halls, it was those websites, all those ideas, and we had a panel that stewed on it for a while and brought it for us. The economic relaunch. You know, so during the during the election phase it was pipelines, jobs, economy. Now it's literally diversification and relaunch. And I think a lot of things that we've seen is relying on each other, pulling together as communities, pulling together as, as businesses really makes sense for this. And then dreaming big again, looking at what we can do with that strategy. Uh, recognition of uncertainty and approvals, yeah, that's, that's obviously pushed capital to south. Um, tax force, so we're putting a group together to actually go after it. We can't be passive anymore because the rest of the jurisdictions are eating our lunch. And we have to be aggressive and self-promoting. But we don't want to do it to the extent of the detriment of the rest of our jurisdictions that are working with us. So again, it's coming down to who do you trade with, what's the long-term incentives, and are these good trading partners as well. Reduce the risk of the unknown, so that's some of the advantages of these routes. Strategic development, less environmental impact. So if we're looking at caribou assessment, it's a big deal up there. I'm not sure if any of you have done linear projects in the past. Any hands? Was that by accident? Or, uh, any, yeah, has anyone read or worked on a linear project specifically with caribou? Okay, it's almost like taking that piece of pie, except instead of chopping the pie into pieces where you get a portion of it, as soon as you cut it, you have to make two new pies. Because as soon as you make that mark on there, you've just now interrupted their habitat. So if we put that in context, as soon as one person puts a power line project out there, you just have that habitat. So if I go and put a pipeline out there, just have that habitat, that's literally what's coming back. So the restrictions that come in place get pretty paramount. But if I'm making one cut and my knife is a little bit thicker, so maybe it's a kilometer wide thick knife that I put through an area, and I'm dealing with that impact once, and I can mitigate the risks and the impacts a lot better. And that's part of the advantage you get to put those borders in place. Uh, landowners, municipalities, so you do it once. Like, let's go through and let's paper this out and let's say a full build up is an example. Everybody knows who's along the corridor. You get full collaboration, participation in it, and everybody kind of knows the rules. It might cost a little bit more, but at least you have project certainty. And that reduces the risk. Again, we as governments and our messaging are the inconsistencies, not the hard work you guys as businessmen are doing and business women and everyone in the industries. It's us. We're, we're the biggest problem. Rail sightings. Uh, only and foremost, there was some pretty neat stuff. So, talking regionally and then uh, uh, or thinking regionally but thinking globally, or working regionally but thinking globally, this applies in our own backyard. So, with these different caucuses that we're a part of, I get invited to all of them. And foremost had a fantastic story out of their read up from down south. They are the hub right now for moving windmills in the province. If anyone's going to put up a windmill or any big sightings or logistics, they figured it out because they wouldn't bought a little rail siding. They figured out how to tie back to the CM. They got the offloading, they got the logistics figured out. They're the de facto place to go to. If you're bringing anything on, on shore, it's a big bulky item that goes through almost. Hoi was over in China at a, at a food conference. And the Chinese delegation there was telling that they love our products, they love the raw products, but they would love to see our finished products even better because they're concerned about their own manufacturers in mainland. They don't know if they're getting melanin in the product or, or anything else. But if it has an Alberta logo on it, and a Canadian flag, they have Project Certainty. So they were so excited about it, they came over and they um, hung out with the Noyan guys and they drove around the countryside. And they were fantastically excited. Our sources are clean. When they go into a field, there's there's nothing like they have back in some of the other countries. They go look at cattle grazing, and it's not intensive, intensive farming, you know, stuck in a factory, so to speak. So what they were proposing was, well, why don't we invest global 49% and you guys get a cooperative or something like that? 
51%, get your factory in place. We'll take all the foodstuffs within that area within 100 clicks. If you can package it, get it onto our tables within 14 days, see so you can contain that stuff up and get it to us, we'll buy everything you want. Those are the type of stories that I'm stumbling into. So when we start talking about our area, we're sitting within a trade utility corridor, we're sitting under the NAFTA agreements, we have access to market, we've got all these things, and we've got the know-how and transferable skill sets. Now we just have to look at it strategically again. These are the type of things when we're talking economic diversity and growing up the pillars of the industry. These are the things we gotta start thinking about here. Now, the other thing is once you get in those nice big um, main lines, the ancillaries come for free. So everything that's gonna feed this, so if I have rail, pipe, power, you put in your backbone, then the ribs start to develop. And then it starts to flesh out with communities, it starts to flesh out with industries. So you're literally taking and putting us in that rural effort and match. So obviously I've been uh, lining up for this one. We got Northwest, the rush is on. Back in the day it was at West Young Man, now it's Northwest. When you start looking at the resources that we have not tapped into, literally tying into Alaska right off the cuff gives me three deep sea port accesses, their volumes are coming down. I've got Misty, Valdez, and uh, Anchorage. I can move both oil tankers and real tankers, not the little skimmers, the 80,000 barrel units that you can get at Blossom because it's a little shallow port. I can get two million barrel tanker units out of there. And I can bring in sea containers. And just spitballing here, if I had a million barrels moving a day by rail to start off with, a million barrels a day moving up to Anchorage or in those areas, that would only tie up those ports for three days of the week. The remaining four days, well, that's cheddar. I'm moving other products that are getting to market, and I've also got backhaul. So simply because of the great circle of where it's, where it's situated and the access to markets to Asia, I can beat you with a two million barrel tanker. You get your little 80, uh, or 80,000 barrel unit coming out of Tawasson. I'll take my two million barrel unit and I'll beat you at Asia four days quicker than you can get there. That's the difference. So those are the type of things we start talking logistics and turnarounds. Um, and literally, I want to eat Seattle and Long Beach and Vancouver charges for lunch. I want to look at it in terminals. I want to start getting this going. Um, UConn, they've been uh, talking about gateway to resources and what their project is. $3 billion is on the table. Uh, arguably, it's a bunch of our money that went east anyway. Now the federal government's giving it back to them. So you've got industry puts up a billion. You've got uh, UConn puts up a billion and the feds put up a billion. And they're looking at building roads and infrastructure to get all their traffic assets, all the mining and everything else. Well, if we looked at putting a corridor, we'd just slide that baby right over through there. So we would open it up, be part of that process, and then reap the rewards again as well. So who's looking at it? There's a couple of groups. Um, the one that's most financially voiced from exploration and talking to and seems to be A2A. And oh, by the way, used taxpayers, you paid for this stuff. So energy a few years back had about $1.8 million kicking around. They fired up the Van Horn Institute, and they actually did all the work. So if you want to look at that online for your information, there's a road. Yes, it's viable stable. They did the analysis for a 25-year operation that still paid off, and the fact that it was multi-commodity. Now, this group A2A goes and picks up that information and says, hey, this is going to make sense. And they started running the numbers. So if Gateway was online, if XL was online, if Line 3 was online, um, and TMX, this thing is still viable. And I'm going to show you some slides later. So it's not like we have uh, a capacity issue. The only reason why the capacity issue is because we can't get the damn products to market. My upstream side, we were already planning on building a bunch because you choked off my pipelines. So it's not like this is by chance. This is a slow dance to socialism. It was the death. It was all those type of things. And I get rather frustrated by that. And I probably shouldn't be speaking up as a politician, but it wasn't by happenstance. So this is us unraveling and getting things back on track again. So these guys really liked that transportation to the quarter concept, so they became the block, the first pass of that big butter going through that bike. Well, then they were totally cool with playing with the other guys along there, and they're totally good with making sure that they have multiple partners, and they're totally good with making sure to open up the industry. Other companies aren't like that. Some of these guys are pretty short-sighted. These folks are on board with a big plan. So here's kind of the road. Now, me being a former project guy, when I'm hearing this stuff, I did pass the sniff test. I started hammering them pretty hard like I would with you know, on any of my project teams. And they kept coming up in spades and feeding more information. And I thought it was fairy tales and pixie dust a bit when I asked them for the actual KMZ file. So this is me literally having their mapping information on my computer taking a screenshot. So I can literally go in there, I can tweak it, I can look at it and everything else. So these guys are full disclosure and they're open for information and, and backing. 
So basically starting up in the Fort McMurray area, we bypass British Columbia, <coughs> to the Northwest Territories, into the Yukon, and that gives us access. So they're like this far away from the presidential crossing in Rome. Um, President Trump, sorry. Uh, so the Alberta segment, that's kind of it. The other tack on that we're looking at literally is to go south, and that would be looking at some inland terminal, uh, because right now CN ties into this road only on one portion of towards high level, and it's kind of stranded on the other side of, of the river. So if you look at CN's infrastructure, it brings you towards the uh, airport in uh, Fort McMurray, it's kind of stranded. If we truly wanted a multi corridor or multi-commodity railroad, well, then you got to get tied in other than just a high level where you could potentially face congestion and there's always that potential for competing companies. Although they have MOU signed with both CN and CP, CN and CP also have those same agreements and depending on the day, it's kind of like a shotgun marriage. If something happens in one track, they move everything over, but the original guy gets precedence over your competitor. So we would basically eliminate all of those issues. Closer to Asia, physically. So if you look down in the lower right hand side, and the line there, that's the 49th. That's literally Vancouver, and that's literally Seattle over that side. Go up to Alaska, where we're east of the side of the Panhandle, you're that much closer, physically. Now, these are fun things. And that's, you know, again, talking about the multi commodities, uh, driving up the GDP. Like, and the exciting part about this is when you look at all the segments of the economy, literally unlocking the Petrochem guys, and you did a presentation to us, one of their major issues they're having is logistics trying to decide between Texas, and they're trying to decide between Alberta. Alberta, okay, we got cheap gas, we have uh, more expensive construction costs, labor force is kind of arguable. Biggest kicker right now, logistics. How do I get my stuff, my plastic pellets, over to Asia so they can sell us iPhones from the back? That's literally what they're trying to unravel. Total distance, well, like Mark said, this is a nation builder. This is not for the faint of heart, but this is for the right reasons. This is something that we can do. And within our wheelhouse, this isn't new technology for us. It's a railroad brand of love. These electric engines, you start phasing in uh, new, new fuels, for example, you might be able to take some of that new hydrogen product we're going to be cracking off and then putting about 20% of that to use easily for your consumptions now. And there's, there's longevity to this. But the worst thing you want to do is go through the Arctic. So I did a diamond mine project that was my first one with for up north. The last thing you want to do in that Arctic space is to start trying new technology. Take something that's tried and tested and true so you can publish it and then you slowly refine it and enhance the long way. So here's where we're talking that little corridor bringing back to Edmonton. So it's got and uh, I think Jody will make these slide decks available for folks so I don't have to go through Edmonton once you want. So here's the economic contributions, the budget, the infrastructure, unlock the north, untrapped, untapped resources up there. That's literally what we're sitting on. We haven't developed it for a number of years. So we start, start tying them together. Uh, market access or oil and gas. Now here's the ironic part. We'll sell our bitumen at a discount because we're selling it to guys who don't want bitumen. But when you sell your bitumen at the actual world price for the guys that actually want the bitumen, all of a sudden it's a premium product. We just can't get it to them. So we start unlocking that, it brings down the differential. And we're also putting the commodity type, the heavies to the heavies on train cars for keeping the lights on the pipes moving into the commodity or the market base that actually wants to buy the lights. So there's part of the I see John and Nani during those items too. Investment. Well, for going growth. Project's about 27 for each billion. The Alberta side would be about $5 billion, roughly. Now the cool thing with this, I'm not going to spend your taxpayer dollars on it. What we want, they are, they're looking potentially for some backstopping, so similar to the AIOC we put in place. Maybe some backstopping dollars, maybe show that we can help them out the front end so it is real, and then that's what attracts the business. Trillions of dollars of capital are required to help right now because Canada has the same risk value as Venezuela. Gentlemen, that got your attention. Yeah, so I did, you heard the right. We're held pretty much the same. You go to New York, of betting your money as Venezuela because no one can figure out what the heck we're doing because that's the messaging we're giving. So again, coming back to that point of project certainty, if a government's kind of backing it, if it looks like you're building a major infrastructure project, who's money for it? The infrastructure bank in Canada is doing it, absolutely. And these guys are willing to segment up the project, put it into four different parts, and start running those processes in parallel, so you're not waiting for one or the other. They're willing to take that risk, but for them to take that risk, we have to say, yeah, we're backstopping the project. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Construction phase, while well, we're spending cash, we're putting people to work. When this thing's actually, uh, during operation. But one of the best things about the railroad is it's a railroad. One of the worst things about the railroad is it's a railroad. Like you literally, these things are intensive. When I put a bike line in the ground, the biggest 
mid labor is when I drop it in the ditch. After that, it's pretty much you know, it's on tap. You're running pumps, doing operations maintenance. Railroads, well, that's real. I mean, we know CN and CD all the time, and there's lots of guys forever and ever and ever. But going up north, that's actually one of the benefits. Because when you look at the First Nations groups up there in those territories, you're putting people to work forever. And again, if we're looking at corridors, that becomes our backbone. We can strap those other less intensive, labor intensive items. But you always have the railroad itself. Yeah, how much do we grow it? This one kind of jumped out at me. If we could get 12% GDP uptick overall, these are the segments of the economy that can grow with it. So again, multi-commodity, not just oil and gas. And again, if you start thinking about some of the ag products, well, it's fired up and let's get things going. Uh, Northwest Territories, it's a big windfall for them as well. Direct jobs, 250, you know, construction jobs, 3,300. Drives up their market as well. Again, untapped resources. Uh, who's ever heard of uh, the what's that called? Mackenzie Valley Delta Pipeline. Have anyone heard of that? Yeah. We've been trying to build that one since, what, the 50s? So the issue with that one is, well, it's gas. There's lots of it. Gas is cheap. And it's 1,700 clicks to get it down to Zama. So the last pass took that. But coincidentally, where we're putting this route, if I did it as a lateral, not to shorten it down to 600 clicks. And President Trump signed off on moving natural gas by rail. So all of a sudden, you start going on with this. The whole Grand Prairie area, instead of sending the condensate back this way or the gas back this way, potentially you're unlocking it to dip other more markets. You run your laterals. Again, I mean, that concept of the back home here's the gateway to resources so again this is from the Yukon site this isn't me scrying on the page this is them they're doing it anyway we step up the train tracks close to it so I won't uh, do this so caution MLA's at work yeah we, we actually are working so I'm not sure how other folks work but I'm a project guy and uh, standing up and talking in the house well that's that's good for the television I know it's good for getting the laws passed and everything else but let me get to work let me go build some projects. And if I can help all the hands out there that don't have work right now because we can't keep shooting ourselves in the foot, if I can get people together, like Mark, like Tracy, like Guthrie, there's a bunch of us all behind the scenes that have logged onto this project, all the different regions that it's going to be working in, all from different backgrounds. One of the guys actually, uh, Mohammed Yassin, actually worked on that uh, Alaska Valley pipeline. He's a contracts guy in that, the last go iteration of it. So that's what we're doing behind the teams. We're, we're putting a team together. And those are the folks who can be working with me and can all do it on this new uh, committee that I was put on. And then pulling industry folks together, go okay, kids. Let's start working together. Let's start driving this. And that's what we're going to do there. Collaboratively with uh, the Yukon Alaska, so we've already had a, and I couldn't believe this, um, you know, lamenting a bit, but Premier Kenny included me, actually asked me to get a call with him to uh, essentially the Dean of Congress in Alaska. Because the Dean of Congress is reaching out to us, wanting to assure us that Alaska is behind this thing. So he included me on that call. That was the day we were touring uh, our area. Sat in there, and I, I, I couldn't believe it. So being the new guy sitting at that level, listening to these type of conversations about building these projects, Minister McIver is going to swept me up under his wing because it's a transportation project. He's kind of made me point on this, specifically for the Alaska corridor. We uh, literally just yesterday spoke with. Uh, uh, Shane Thompson, he's the Minister of Transportation up in Northwest Territories. So these are the type of things we're doing right now. And now we've got access to Yukon as well to start putting our project teams in place. Uh, how we're going to work collaboratively to get this thing happen and see how far we can drive it forward. So the, the federal politics, and that's where everyone gets nervous. Oh, okay. Are the feds behind us? Feds love railroads for some reason. They even take credit for it, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so we can send them our cash and we can get them behind this. This is a big hearts and minds thing for them. So if you have all the First Nation communities are actually participants that not just going out there and doing some survey work, although they are not just going out there and you know, maybe showing up once in a while for the photo ops. No, this is theirs, they're going to own part of it. So A to A right out the gate said, yeah, we want that to be owners and here's the X number of part of the percentages. Um, as a businessman that kind of pains you to sell, you know, just about half your company or, or put it up there, but for projects certainly longevity and for the right things. Absolutely, and that's powerful. Oh, the railway act. Because they're powerful. Um, yeah, Mark had mentioned the railway act, so here's some cool stuff. So when uh, Johnny McDonald was building this railroad, do you think he had problems with tying things together too? So there's some old legislation out there under the Railway Act that gives um, a lot of 
I don't want to say power, but it gives more latitude, I guess, to make things happen in an expeditious manner because that's when it was first put in place was back back in the times where we needed to drive these things through. So when we're doing a railroad, essentially it gives us uh, a streamlined process that makes more sense. It's the, the least red tapey thing we got out to <laughs> put it in context. I can pull that one off the shelf and I can get to work. So it helps expedite the process. The other thing federally is when you have a project that spans uh, provincial jurisdictions, then you know, just look at the project. Uh, we did this in pipeline as well, with project certainty. We would carve that project up in the different companies within those provinces or states. And then when you run your risk register and you look at the, the risks on it, mitigating factors, we would build these things until you got that golden well. Like we didn't have presidential crossing approval on Clipper until just about before we're shooting wide down the line. And then we had these nice photo ops for the guys on both sides were actually doing that last time. So these are the things that we in Pipeline have done. So when I was talking to them on this, they ran it by their engineering group, who was HDR out of the States there, and they also had the ACOM guys did the original study on the Van Horn. They started looking at the models, and sure enough, yeah, they built a railroad in Quebec. HDR did it, they did the same thing. So this is not an untried process, it's something we can just dust off again, getting good people together around the table with good ideas working together to solve problems. Yeah, sweat equity. That is the best thing that I can give you. The best thing that I can give you is you cut yourself a consultant who used to make his living working for big companies and bridge and trans Canada and all the likes and jumping across and problem solving. Working for you, as my wife will put it, a substantially reduced rate. <laughs> to go in there, drive a project, get the bureaucrats working for us, and get at that concept. So this guy in the buy here at the end. I'm not gonna go through the slides and runners. Talking too much now, I'm not going to anyway. But the sky high at the end is literally to take the full build of the corridor. So if you can stay with me on this, I drive my railroad in, I put a kilometer on either side of it, that becomes my de facto corridor. What I do with those interprovincial groups is I put 48 inch gas lines, 36 inch pipelines, I put in my fiber optics, I put in my road, I put in my power lines on paper. I take it down the hallway as if it's somebody from the outside actually making that application. I say, this is what we want to build. What do we got to do to get it done? You get the pre-approvals on that. It goes into a nice binder and sits on that shelf and, it, and anyone who comes up will dangle that carrot over the street and say, hey, you want to build a pipeline? You want to go up this way? Take this route, pre-approved. Here you go. Or, see you in 10 years and good luck. Because that's how the rest of the process works. That's the challenge and that's the thing that, that I want to do, and we want to do as MLAs, is to fire up the sweat equity of us elected officials and going down the hallway and get some guys' desks and ladies' desks too, we won't discriminate there, to make sure that we get this done. So that's the idea, and honestly, when you look at jurisdictions that are doing that, so the 49th, that's what they've actually done. Pre-approved concept, we'll make it happen. Sort of the details. You've already got it executed at the highest level, we'll make it happen.